My name is Malte. I'm super happy to be here today and uh, speak about a topic that uh, really uh, excites me. Um, and this is like, how can we actually make access to information more efficient? Um, how can we also rethink search to actually achieve this uh, efficient access? And uh, how can we use technologies like um, LP, like transformers, um, to actually get there? And this, these questions are actually also what I'm uh, mostly um, involved with in my daily job. Um, um, as mentioned, I'm CTO of a, a startup, DeepSet, uh, based here in Berlin. Uh, and this is, we are sitting basically somewhere between uh, research and industry on the other side. And um, what we observe in, on the research side is basically that there's this big search of deep learning based NLP. Um, there's things like transfer learning becoming possible. Um, that really help uh, adapting models easily to different tasks, different domains. Uh, we have transformer models, of course, uh, really beating each other, let's say, on a weekly base on, on benchmarks, how uh, breaking new performance uh, scores. And new tasks like uh, question answering um, who um, became possible, I would say, overnight um, and uh, make a lot of things interesting and impossible. Uh, on the other side, we have the industry and um, uh, a lot of enterprises with uh, huge piles of text data, a lot of documents, a lot of information that is somehow buried in there. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of employees trying to make sense of it, uh, searching for the right answer, uh, reading through a long, long PDFs. Uh, and um, yeah, in, in some cases, uh, just wasting time. In other cases, uh, actually missing information and uh, important information. So what we try is really uh, bridging this gap. And um, that's why we built uh, Haystack. It's an uh, open source uh, framework um, that really helps developers to build um, modular pipelines, modular semantic search pipelines um, that, uh, that allow developers in the industry um, to use these latest models from, from the research side. Um, it's not always about models. And I think that's also one of the reasons why there is this gap actually because there's much more to, to of course, make it uh, work in production, to make it work in the industry. And that's why also Haystack is, uh, is um, somehow centered around these problems, these challenges. It's really covering at the end-to-end -end, uh, life cycle, if you will, so for, for these kind of pipelines. Um, very short, if you're interested in the stuff that I'm talking about here today, uh, reach out to me afterwards. We are uh, growing a lot and we are we're hiring. Um, in this talk today, I would uh, yeah, really um, structure it into four basic blocks, um, starting a bit with a state of search. Where are we today and how do transformers fit in there? Um, then uh, talking a bit about um, typical challenges when you move to production and, uh, and today here focusing on one challenge, which is around how to scale. How can we bring these big models uh, uh, to, to millions of documents? Um, going then forward with uh, some open source, some coding part um, to show you basically how you can do that yourself, how you can use um, uh, this open source framework Haystack um, to build such pipelines, what are the core design principles that we have in there, um, and, uh, and hopefully you can trans kind of translate that to, to your work and maybe see um, areas where that might be useful uh, in your daily job. Um, last but not least, then short outlook. Uh, where we think this um, search days, this area is, is moving that way. So let's uh, go a bit back in time. Let's go back five years and, um, and maybe try to remember how Google looked back then. If you uh, were looking for something um, like the address of the Eiffel Tower, you probably um, just did a keyword query, um, Eiffel Tower address. And uh, what you saw was then basically a list of website links um, and you went to one of these websites to maybe find out this address or um, the closing times or whatever um, you wanted to, to get. Today, that looks a bit different. And um, the first, it starts basically with a query. Um, maybe you're not doing a, a keyword query anymore, but now you can actually do um, some more, let's say, full sentences, full questions, some uh, what we call natural language queries. Um, and, um, and if you do that, you will actually get uh, usually better better results. Um, what do I mean with better results? Um, it can be um, that you directly get the answer to actually your, your question to your information need on the top. Uh, here the address of the Eiffel Tower um, and you're done. Right? Then you don't need to actually search further and don't need to go to, to another website. Uh, it might also be that um, you see some related questions, some FAQ and maybe you have like a follow-on question after you found this address. Maybe you want to know uh, how much does it cost to go to the Eiffel Tower? So great, you can just jump in directly here. 
Um, on the bottom, there's, there's still like then the list, of course, of uh, website links. Um, but also there, things have changed. Um, one thing, for example, is this kind of preview that we have down here. It's not uh, anymore just uh, say the start of the website, you know, the first paragraph. Um, but uh, we try here to show really a meaningful passage. In that case, uh, it might be a bit small here, but it's also about the address of this Eiffel Tower. Uh, in other cases, actually not uh, not even uh, a passage that is on the website, but really a condensed summary of different parts of the website. So all these things um, kind of changed, and there's and there's way more even. Um, if we want to summarize that maybe a bit and like what are these main trends, what is like behind these features that we now saw, um, I would probably summarize it like this. There's one big shift towards content. Uh, so it's really coming more and more about the texts and uh, and less about, let's say, web metrics, web metadata, um, less about page rank um, or what other people searched but really trying to, to leverage what we have and try to judge how relevant is this text uh, for this given query. And, uh, and that's, I think, a big uh, shift in paradigm. Um, in addition, um, there's, uh, of course, not only text data, but there is um, also other types uh, of, of um, file formats of media types. There's videos, there's maps, and all that get kind of fused uh, with your search query. Second big trend that we observe is um, what some people call zero-click search, and that's really what um, what we had in this previous example. You have a query, and maybe you're looking for a certain piece of information, and you don't need to go to another website. Uh, once you see these first search results, that's enough. You're you're satisfied, and um, there's estimates that uh, around about two thirds of Google queries um, are actually this um, type of zero-click search. And, um, and um, that's, of course, for the user, super convenient. And it's really a, um, a short um, time to search, let's say, a time to uh, results. Um, if you go a bit beyond that, if you look under the hood, um, you will see that um, transformers are really all around. And um, they're really kind of invading all of these different uh, search features and uh, different areas, uh, subspaces of search. Um, that includes, um, I'd say, the, really the core, I would say, of information retrieval and search, uh, document retrieval, and listing, a set of relevant documents, uh, but then also more adjacent um, areas like re-ranking, question answering, what we will have a look at today, uh, particularly, um, and then uh, even fields like auto-suggest, summarization, translation, and many more, um, like, I would say, areas that you usually don't uh, bring in connection with search directly, uh, but are now kind of more and more getting into uh, into this um, this field or like uh, getting part of it, becoming part of it. Um, Google is of course one of the um, like on the frontier there and um, also one of the big innovators behind transformers. Um, they did actually the not only the innovation but they all also brought them into production and really at Google scale very fast. Like one year after the uh, let's say initial pa <laughs> initial research paper that was published, um, they actually had the first queries running. Uh, live uh, uh, when you do Google queries. And um, uh, Pandu Nayak, the VP of search, actually said uh, in an article, like, this was the biggest leap forward in the past five years and probably the, one of the biggest one uh, in the whole history of, of search. So that's really exciting. And uh, and uh, and now I want to focus, like, zoom a bit in, like, how are these transformers used? And uh, as we don't have time to cover all of these areas today, uh, I will focus on document retrieval and, and question answering. So for document retrieval, uh, the, I think the, the use case is uh, probably pretty clear. The user makes a query, and the system returns a set of relevant documents. That's what we want to do. Traditionally, we can do that um, uh, via sparse methods, um, also sometimes called keyword-based approaches. Um, algorithms there include TF-IDF, BM25, um, you know, usually the, also the algorithms that run behind technologies like Elasticsearch. And they have Basically, they, they work with one uh, principle. They try to match uh, similar strings. Uh, they want to match keywords. And um, there is a one uh, fundamental um, belief behind it, or like principle behind it, which is called back of words, that you treat a document really, break it into a separate words, uh, and you don't care about the order. It's just like a random back, a random collection, unordered, and that's enough to, to find matches uh, of an overlap of these words. 
Um, that's very fast. No? It's, it's also pretty lightweight. It's very efficient and actually works probably better than, than you would, uh, would think and surprisingly well. Uh, and that's, I think, also why it has been around for such a long time and uh, is really the core of most uh, or many search engines out there. Uh, we then afterwards had, a, I would say, a short period where people tried to move forward and uh, tried things like word embeddings, word to vec glov, and so on, um, and mostly failed, I would say. Um, and that's also, I think, one reason why in the industry uh, many people were um, uh, unsatisfied, but disappointed of machine learning, and uh, it was not outperforming BM25, even though it was promised in, in some research papers, um, and that, I think, got quite some frustration. Um, but now we have, um, since I would say one, two years, uh, another category and really like a, a game changer, I would say. Um, and um, there are like these transformer based approaches now, um, which really go this, I would say, full step towards dense retrieval. Um, and yeah, algorithms there include DPR and, and sentence transformers. We will later actually have a, a, a bit more look at uh, DPR and how that, uh, how that works in comparison to others. Um, these dense approaches, they really focus on semantic similarity. So not if there's really like a string overlap. Uh, it also works um, if you have just an overlap, overlap of, let's say, synonyms. And these synonyms don't have to be um, prepared manually and maintained, but this is like automatically something in these models. Um, and these uh, models are context aware. So um, if you have uh, like a sentence like, uh, I'm sitting on a bank, uh, and another one, uh, I want to get money from the bank. Um, the, word, the word bank has a completely different meaning, and even though there's like a, a string overlap, the semantic overlap or similarity is actually quite low. Um, these methods uh, have one um, fundamental uh, principle. They represent documents as vectors, and, um, and this is also really important for, let's say, the technology surrounding these models. How do we index? How, what kind of databases are we using? Let's now move on to question answering. So document retrieval, I think that's you know, the core. Most people know it. question answering. Maybe some of you know it. Um, but for me, that's really the, the most exciting uh, uh, piece where transformers uh, play a role these days. And it's, I think, one of the key elements for um, getting towards a zero-click search. And in question answering, yeah, we really have a, a question coming in. We have a document. And then we put it into some reader model, some NLP model, some transformer and this model spits out the answer. Um, there are two types you know, the, how you can do that. And the most popular one is uh, extractive uh, question answering. And there, the model kind of searches for a span, you know, for a small string in this document that, that might be the answer. In our case here, large city of Germany, that is uh, somewhere here in this first lines. Um, however, there's also another direction, which is uh, generative question answering, um, where um, the model really that generates a new sequence, generates uh, the answer itself. And um, while this is still, I would say, in the early days, it's super promising because then you can really condense information from different areas of the text uh, and maybe even do some calculus, like combining different metrics if you want so, uh, to do that, uh, and then kind of you know, condensing all that in, your, in the final answer. Um, why is it so exciting and, and, and powerful? Um, well, it's, uh, it's really just became possible in the last, I would say, one, two years. Um, and it's uh, probably one of the most universal applications of NLP because you can not only use it for search, you know, like for these answer boxes on the top, but you can also use it for other, other use cases like um, the long tail of chatbot intents. Uh, so it cannot cover usually all, all of the chatbot queries in advance. You can model them all in advance. So maybe you can just uh, use um, such a QA model for for really the, say, the remaining 1,000, 2,000 queries that users might have. Um, similarly, you can use it for information extraction. Huh? If you have some workflows to automate, maybe for every invoice that comes in, you want to extract the, the amount. Huh? You ask, okay, what is, what is the amount that I have to pay? You get the answer, and you can use that in, in further automation steps. So that's really nice. Um, and uh, to give you a small flavor, let's maybe jump to a quick demo. Oh, I hope you can see that Let me zoom in a bit. Um, so behind the scenes, there's Haystack running. It's a very simple UI. And now we can ask questions uh, on, on documents about Harry Potter. So we have here like a corpus around Harry Potter indexed. And we can ask stuff like, what is the Patronus of Harry? And uh, now we see, we can uh, highlight basically in the text, ah, okay, it's like a deer, uh, a stack, 
um, magical manifestation of goodwill and happiness. Um, we can also ask um, yeah, stuff like what is actually a Patronus? Maybe not, not everyone here is a, is a Harry Potter geek. Uh, what is uh, a Patronus? Um, and then we actually see, ah, okay, Patronus is this like magical manifestation of goodwill and happiness, uh, partially tangible positive energy force, um, and a few other definitions. So I hope you get the idea. No? It's like um, it can kind of enrich your your search results and give you a quite fast idea what is uh, what is in your corpus. Um, for our users, who is not Harry Potter <laughs> corpora, but uh, can be like from finance or legal or, or any other domain where a lot of information is stored in text. So. That's like roundabout what you can do on a very, let's say, high level with uh, with transformers, with these kind of models. So let's now zoom a bit further in into one of the typical challenges. And um, of course, there are there are multiple challenges when when moving, like, say, this research methods and models to production. And um, and the most common questions that we get uh, are kind of listed here. Does it work for my domain? How can I find the best model? Do users really prefer this uh, kind of search results? And a very common one is like, does it work at scale? How can I can, can I make that happen? The biggest challenge that we have here is uh, really the speed of this uh, reader model that we saw, this QA model, and um, that actually scales linearly with the number of docs. And uh, that's of course bad. Like if you have millions of documents, that's incredibly slow. Um, the solution is that we uh, have a pipeline where we combine these two things that we saw previously, a retriever and a reader. And um, this retriever acts Kind of as a fast filter. Uh, let's imagine we have one million documents in, in our document store here. Uh, maybe the retriever identifies the 10 or 50 most promising documents for my search query uh, and then uh, passing those on to the reader. And the reader then only works on those uh, limited set and, and finds the answer. With that, well, we already almost get a constant query time because the reader has a constant uh, amount of text uh, that, that it needs to work on. Um, to give you a rough idea, like what kind of improvement we can get here, um, if we have a corpus with around like 100k docs, uh, just using this reader, just applying directly QA, would probably take uh, yeah, more than 30 hours. Um, putting in the retriever here, we can get it uh, down to um, below a second, usually maybe a bit above. Okay, that's great, <laughs> but uh, we are now fine with the speed. But uh, how can we assure that we maintain the quality? I mean, it's like all now relies on this retriever. How can we make sure that it really gets the, the relevant documents here to, to our reader model? For that, let's have a quick look at these two type of categories, two type of retrievers that, uh, that were briefly uh, mentioned in the, in the beginning of this talk. On the one hand, we have sparse retriever. I think it was also covered in a few other talks uh, here at the conference. Um, so very quickly, you have a text, uh, you break it down to tokens or words, and you represent it then as a, as a very sparse vector uh, of dimension of the vocabulary size that you have. So maybe something like 30,000 uh, entries here in your vector, and only a few are like one or other values for, for the actual tokens that, that are present in your text. And that's uh, very helpful if you want uh, exact word matches, um, then it's very powerful. But there's also this other category, um, this dense retrievers, um, where we actually pass this text to a model uh, that can be a transformer, for example. And then we get uh, also a vector out of, out of there, but a very dense one. That's why it's called dense retriever. Um, uh, so it means like lower dimensionality, typically you know, like 500 to 1000 uh, uh, dimensions here. And they're all populated, uh, all populated with, uh, with some numerical values. And uh, these kind of methods work very well when we want to find you know, semantically most similar texts uh, and, uh, and don't want to rely just on these keywords. Um, that's where they really outperform. So let's have a look at one of these uh, dense retriever models and architectures. Um, I would say right now there's really one uh, uh, quite popular one um, called dense passage retriever from, uh, from Facebook. And just to give you a rough idea here, what is the, the, uh, the architecture in there? We have one transform model here on the query side and one on the document side, uh, which means 
when we have a query, uh, we pass that really to that model and get a certain vector representation. When we um, have a document, we pass it to a different model, a second transform model, and that creates this new vector. Um, when we have those two, we can uh, calculate the dot product, and that gives us the similarity score uh, for our search. Um, they are trained uh, jointly together, uh, so they fit to each other. Um, and the reason I would say the, the intuition why we have here two models is really that the query, the text of the query is a very different nature to the one of a document. Uh, documents are very long, very verbose, uh, different style of language. Query is like very short, sometimes missing out words maybe. Um, so that's why it's kept basically as a side. Okay, that's uh, that's great. Now we have these two transformer models. So how does it actually, uh, uh, why doesn't that make it slower now again? Um, uh, we saw earlier we run transformers for on all documents. Uh, it's very slow. Uh, so how can we do it now here? Um, basically we can shift a lot of that computation towards the indexing time and uh, basically run this part here of the graph, the transformer um, uh, for the document uh, on all documents that we have. Uh, we get a vector for each document and we put this vector into our uh, our database. Then at query time, uh, we just need one single vector, just like a very fast pass through that model. And we can then con uh, basically calculate uh, um, the dot product to, to all vectors in our database. That's already quite good, that's fast. Um, still, uh, uh, you can imagine if the more vectors we have here in the, in the database, the longer uh, this dot product calculation takes uh, time, like the longer it takes. And uh, again, we're back to scaling with the number of, of documents that we have. So what can we do? Um, there's uh, uh, thankfully one nice uh, nice trick. We can do uh, approximate nearest neighbor search, also called A and N. Uh, and with that, we can really get it back to, um, to constant time. And um, there are a few algorithms that we don't, can cover, can't cover in the time here today, uh, but uh, HNSW, Annoy, there are a few there. And uh, they really make um, this um, uh, constant time with uh, some tree-based methods or hash-based tricks. Okay, great. So let's have a look like what does it mean now in numbers? Uh, so uh, we said we want to be better than, uh, than BM25. That's why we use DPR. And we want to be fast. That's why I say, okay, let's use this approximate, approximation. So DPR, uh, HNSW. In this chart, we see uh, basically um, a measure of accuracy, the, the mean average precision here, 100 being like, perfect. Um, and here down the number of docs, the more we have, you know, the, the harder it is to uh, harder it is to find the needle in the haystack, of course. Um, so um, uh, what we see here is uh, basically uh, the D DPR, HNSW, uh, this approximation is a bit worse than like, the exact DPR, but it's still way ahead of, of BM25. Uh, if you're interested in more details about this benchmark, uh, I linked here also the uh, website where we have more, more of them. Okay, so we are in accuracy uh, terms better. So how about speed? Um, Speed-wise, um, we have BM25 here. It's like queries per second that you see here. Um, and uh, with Elasticsearch and that setup, we get around about 80. Um, if we use DPI exact, uh, that would be incredibly slow, uh, 1.5. With uh, this approximation, we are somewhere in the middle. And the cool thing is now that we can actually adjust this approximation and move like uh, as we wish, but basically between a uh, perfect uh, match and very ac exact to like more heuristic, but then faster. So that's, I would say, one of the key tricks to, to make uh, things work, to make things scale with these uh, dense retrieval models and also um, for, for extractive QA. Um, still, I get uh, I guess you, you see that there's like a lot of things involved. And also like it's not only about the models, it's also about um, then these vector databases that can do um, uh, fast calculations, fast approximations. Um, and um, we try with Haystack basically to cover all of that, that you don't need to worry about it, don't need uh, to know all these details, you can stick it together. And if you wish, you can still kind of fine tune it. So let's have a quick look um, at Haystack and the um, core design principles there. So as mentioned, fully open source, check it out on GitHub um, and try it out. Um, it's uh, written in Python um, and the focus is really around search and information extraction. Um, the key philosophy that we have is, I would say, inspired by Lego, um, where you have these nice standardized building blocks 
that can have different colors and maybe like slightly different uh, um, implementations, let's say, um, but you can stick them together as you wish to really complex things. And um, that's also how we build Haystack. It's very modular. We have um, uh, standardized classes with uh, standardized interfaces. And then below the, under the hood, you can choose of different implementations that, that fit for a use case. And uh, because we have these interfaces, we can connect them very easily to, to pipelines and uh, adjust it basically for, for the use case, the domain that we are in. Um, yeah, it's really end-to-end, -end, not just the models. Um, it also includes data acquisition. We have like a REST API on top and uh, what we call quality of life features. So there's a lot of small things uh, that uh, usually helps and can be converter functions, some helper functions, uh, a crawler and uh, these kind of things. We also believe that we uh, yeah, don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of other great open source projects out there. So we also integrate with, uh, with many of them, especially actually on the, on the database side um, uh, where um, yeah, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So let's have a co quick look at these building blocks. Uh, what, what can you actually use in Haystack? Um, there are the document stores um, where we have a uh, big variety, some of the, I would say, more well-known traditional ones, SQL Elastic, uh, but then also many of this vector-focused uh, databases, Milvis, Weaviate, and that phase. Uh, we have retrievers, different flavors. We have different uh, readers, these kind of QA models from, from different frameworks. Um, we have generators to generate answers. Uh, and file converters to actually get your you know, files from PDF or, or docx or whatever into, a, into the document store. There's much more. We don't have time to cover all of them, but I hope you get an idea that there are different pieces, different building blocks that you can put together. Um, how can you put them together? Well, we have this uh, concept of pipelines and, um, and uh, it's really more, let's say, real-time pipelines, not big uh, batch jobs or anything. Um, and there are two ways to define them in Python. One is using uh, like standard uh, patterns, standard classes. So if you want to do this type of QA uh, that, that you saw on the previous slides, you can just use that existing pipeline and it's really a few lines of code. If you want to make it more custom, uh, you can also start with an empty pipeline and then add node by node and kind of connect them via the inputs. I say, okay, input is a query and then the next one input is this DPR retriever that we, that we have here. Um, and then really define custom pipelines. There's also two other ways to think about it uh, or to, uh, to do them. There's YAMLs, uh, um, similar idea and uh, usually helpful in production when you want to configure stuff and save stuff. Um, and in the end, under the hood, it's, uh, it's really direct acyclic graphs. And that's also a way to think it, to um, export graphics and to manipulate these, uh, these kind of modes. Um, very quick overview because um, we're also a bit running out of time. Um, what you can do with these pipelines is then, of course, more than these simple sequential pipelines. You can uh, do parallel stuff. So you can say, okay, let's do two, uh, use two retrievers and, uh, and then show the results. Um, you can also do branching. So you can say, depending on the type of query that comes in, maybe it's a keyword query, we route it to a certain path, or it's uh, a question, then we may route it to another path of our pipeline. All of that is on GitHub. Uh, check out the docs. Um, all the code is, is there. Tutorials are there. And if you have any questions, uh, reach out on Slack. Um, very quick, the Outlook. Uh, what is next? Um, we uh, work on distributing the pipelines with a framework called Ray, uh, which I think is really exciting. Uh, we really believe generative QA is, uh, is on the rise and, uh, and will be the future. Um, we're working on extending that to many other data types so that you can also ask directly into a database, not only text or to images. And last but not least, we believe in uh, uh, 10 years from now, most of the applications will have a semantic interface, a language interface, and uh, we, we want to be the semantic layer there to, to translate it actually to the, to the computer system. Um, yeah, um, share, slides will be shared afterwards. Um, and as mentioned, we are hiring. Please, please switch out. I'm now very happy to, to hear some questions. Great, Malta, thank you so much for that talk. Uh, I can say I've used uh, Haystack and it was super helpful to build a quick demo. So I would recommend uh, other people check it out as well if they're interested. There are a couple of questions. We're um, a bit short on time, so we can do a couple of questions and then we'll have people move over to the breakout room. Uh, so we'll be in later, uh, we'll be in the France Salon breakout room. 
Uh, one question that came up, uh, I think, was already answered. So uh, the question was about, um, uh, yeah, ensuring how do you ensure that uh, your queries don't get slow? Uh, how do you make sure that the response times stay low? Uh, you talked about the retriever reader uh, stack. Um, do you want to mention anything else about how to keep response times down, as that can be an issue with uh, big transformer models? Yeah, yeah. So um, I mean, obviously, like uh, hardware GPUs ha help. Um, then uh, the document length is important. So many people miss that. Um, if you let's say the retriever returns always uh, ten documents, that's nice. But if these t documents are like one hundred pages or two hundred pages each, then it's still like a lot of text to process. Um, and last but not least, we are uh, I think runtimes are also important. If you I know use PyTorch or something like that. It helps to to move to other other runtimes like uh, ONLX, for example, uh, or TensorRT. Um, and also on the model efficiency side, there's also a lot of stuff to to gain with uh, pruning and and similar techniques. Okay, uh, and I believe I don't know if you mentioned uh, document splitting as well, but I believe you guys have a preprocessor where you can take a full document and split it into passages. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. So for these methods okay. like DPR, for example, um, that's really helpful to split them into more passages of maybe 200 words, and uh, and that's all what we have in this preprocessor and uh, and uh, what I would call also quality of life features. It's it's not about it's not the fancy part, but it's the stuff that is annoying and uh, and you don't want to waste time as a, as a developer with, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the more popular questions uh, is about how a search engine like Vespa fits into the picture of Haystack? Where would Vespa fit in? Uh, so I don't know Vespa in detail, to be honest. OK. So that makes it hard for me. Uh, but I, so think I can give you a short, be, a short TLDR. Uh, Vespa is a search engine like Solar or Elastic, but they have ANN uh, indexed via HNSW natively uh, in Vespa. Mm -hmm. um, they have uh, learning to rank. Um, you can also do uh, Onyx inference. Um, so some of the reader tasks can be done uh, as well. Maybe that's enough for you to answer. <laughs> Where does it fit into the to the haystack picture? Yeah. Um, so like from what, what I see from others as well. I mean, there's uh, there's other frameworks, other libraries out there. Um, and many of them focus on the vector similarity search, I believe, and uh, and not so much around uh, tooling around and basically having really this pipeline idea and the flexibility to adjust it. So something like uh, this query classifier. Uh, or bringing in like a summarizer, a translator, all that are now kind of notes in Haystack that you can plug in and you can write easily your own notes. So that's uh, what we see. It's, uh, it's not always just retrieval and maybe QA, but you really want to have uh, more flexibility in the pipelines. 